I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Campaign Monitor. I'll just quickly show of hands, how many of you heard about Campaign Monitor? Wow, a lot. That's good. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just give a quick introduction about Campaign Monitor. Um, so today I'll be talking about scaling engineering teams for growth, and um, it's one of my biggest passion. Um, I'll be talking a lot about philosophies, how we scale, but also some concrete examples of how we actually did it in Campaign Monitor. So Campaign Monitor started about 12 years ago by these two guys, classic startup story, it's two guys in a garage somewhere, building and be successful. Um, so that's what they did. Um, and they built a very successful email newsletter SaaS company. Um, and one of the biggest advantage we have is because we focus so much on the experience and the design, a lot of people call us the apple of email marketing. Um, and about two years ago, we got a huge VC funding uh, from a company called Inside Partners in San Francisco. Um, it's 250 million US dollars. Um, it was an Australian record back then. And from there, we have a huge growth ambition. We want to grow our market. We want to add more functionalities. We want to grow the team. We want to grow the, the company. <coughs> and But what happened was, two years ago, we are very slow. Um, we, we built uh, our feature, uh, one of our more flexible feature. It took us more than a year to build. It was so difficult to add more functionalities to the system. We have legacy. Uh, system about 12 years, about 10 years back then. Um, it was just so hard to add more features. And I was brought in to help to scale. So in the last two years, we grew the, the team from 50 people to 250 people, the company. We grew the engineers from 20 engineers to 70 engineers. We, we added more teams from one feature team to seven, seven feature teams from one code base to many code bases, from one deployment per month to many deployments per day, from one big product release in a year to many small product releases in a year, in a month. And this is a story in the last 16 months transformational journey since we began. So how did we scale? Th this is the fundamental of what we believe. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent but the one that's most responsive to change. To be able to be competitive in a market, especially email marketing industry, you need to be able to adapt to change very, very quickly. And to be able to adapt to change, you need to be able to have teams that can react and make decisions very quickly on the floor. So our idea of scale is not that. It's not about adding more people and create hierarchy. We need to change the way we think. We need to think about how value is being delivered to our customers, how value is being propagated from every people within your company, and think about how, how we can create a structure that focuses on the value. And that's the idea of what we think about scaling. So rather than creating a big hierarchical structure, why don't we create multiple small teams that f have a strong focus on delivering value to the customers. We call them the self-organizing teams. And what do I mean by self-organizing teams? And how do, you, how do we create self-organizing teams? So there are five areas that we, 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 we did transformation upon. So, um, there's a person called Frederick Taylor, if you ever heard about it. He's, he's the father of modern scientific management. And his philosophy is actually separate the managers from the people. Get the managers to the thinking, get the people to the work. Because people can't think. The managers need to do the thinking and organize the work for people. And that is the father of modern scientific management. He's the one who creates the management that we know of today. And that is also the reason why we have hierarchies in the organization. But there's also another guy who's called Edward Deming. He was the guy that being sent to Japan to help to rebuild Japan economy uh, after the World War, II, World, World War II. 
And he believes, he has a famous saying that a bad system will always beat good people. He believes that people fundamentally just want to have a chance to work with pride, to build something good. He believes in people. And it's always the system of work that actually cause the people can give their best. And that's why there are these five areas that I think need to be transformed to be able for us to scale. So I want to start with the culture. There's a famous saying by A.G. Toyota, the president of the Toyota uh, Motors. He said, before cars make people. He fundamentally believed that people is the biggest asset of his company. In order for the company to grow and be able to build great cars, he needs to build their people. And that's what we believe in in Camp and Monora. When I found Camp and Monora uh, 16 months ago when I joined, I spoke to every single person in the, in the company. And what I found was there's a lot of smart people in this company. The problem is the way we work is broken. The second thing that we need to change is the way we build things. We have this fixation of building the perfect solution. We have this fixation of if it's not ready, don't ship it. We need to change our mentality. We need to change our focus. It's an experiment. Every single thing is an experiment. We need to test it, learn. For an organization to be able to scale, we need to be able to respond quickly, so we need to experiment quickly. And the last thing, the, the role of a manager is, shouldn't be about distributing tasks. The role of the manager should be about, as a coach, help the team to learn, help the team to get better, help the team to experiment, inspire them, challenge them. The second thing that we need to change is people. We are a strong believer in attitude, above aptitude. So um, we want people to collaborate. We want people to work together. And this is always the biggest temptation when we have really good people applying to the company, really smart people. But then they, they, they do not want to work with other people. They just want to be working on themselves. They want to be the hero. And it's really hard challenge to turn those people down. And we have a couple of occasions we just have to turn people down because I don't want to work with other people. I just want to do it myself. And then that's not going to work. Building software is a team sport. And we want to hire that w people that are willing to cross competencies. We want to hire people that are willing to learn about other disciplines. People that are willing to build empathy. It's not just about sitting in the corner doing your, your work yourself but we, we willing to collaborate. So I call these people T-shaped people. T-shaped people is an expert in one area and, and start building competencies, basic competencies in other areas. So one example that we did in Camp and Monitor is we say quality is the responsibility of everyone. So rather than have a, s a single QA team that tests everything, we abolish the whole QA team and basically Quality now is part of your each of the team. You need to test your own software. You build shit, you live with the shit. You have to fix the shit, basically. <laughs> so what we change the role of the QA people is to become QA coach. They come in and coach the people within the team on how to do good QA. And the, peop the team is responsible for the quality. Structure. We used to have team of designers. We used to have team of developers. We used to have a team of QAs. We, have to, we used to have team of product managers. We changed into cross-functional team. Basically, we divvy up the product area into multiple uh, focus areas, and we assign each team to be responsible for it. And they have a clear focus goal together. Basically, it's no longer acceptable, a developer say, Oh, I've done with my feature. It's now up to the QA to test it. It's up to the ops people to deploy it. If there's a, a problem in production, that's their problem. It's no longer acceptable. Everybody focus on the same goal. Everybody deliver the same goal. If there's a problem, everybody responsible for it. And how do we structure the leadership of the team? 
I love this book so much. So Dan Ping say in his book, there are two kind of motivation. There are extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is like money, status, position. But intrinsic motivation works so much better than extrinsic motivation. There are three things that makes intrinsic motivation. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is the desire to direct our own lives. It's, it's, it's common sense, really. Like, you don't want to be treated like kids, right? To be told what to do all the time. It's like having a teenager. Like, if you have a teenager, you know what I mean. Um, and, and mastery is the urge to make progress, to get better in something that you do. It's, that's why gamification is so popular. Yeah, because people want to get better and better and better. That's why people spend so much money with playing games, because they just want to get better in what they do. Um, and if you see people busking in the street on the weekend, you know, it's not because simply they want to earn money, but a lot of them actually want to showcase their talent. They want to get better in what they do. Purpose. It's the yearning to do what we do in the service of something larger than ourselves. People like to make an impact. People like to feel like they make a change in this world. And to be, to be told to do something without understanding why is the most demotivating things ever. So using those three principles, this is how we structure our team in Campaign Monitor. Every team has three key roles in it, which is the product manager, the technical lead and delivery lead. The product manager's job is not to tell the team what to do. Their job is to talk to the customers, talk to the other people within the company to understand why it is important. What is the impact if we're going to build these features or functionalities? The why is the most important thing. And bring that why to the team so the team can understand what the customer feel. The technical lead is responsible for mastering. The, the job is to coach the team, to help the team to get better, set the standard for the team, challenge them. What is good look like for the team? The delivery lead is responsible for autonomy. If there's one sentence I would describe their job is to make themselves redundant. To the point that the team is so self-organizing that their role is no longer needed. This is an example of the extent that we do it in Campaign Monitor. So about four months ago, we need to restructure the team. We, we, we added three more teams to, to from four to seven. And we did it in a way of self-selection. So the way we do it is we create constraint within each of the team. And we say, look, this, that team can only have four people. That team can only have three people. That team can only have two people. I mean, two engineers. We've, we, we have pre-selected the product manager, the technical lead, and delivery lead. And then we ask the engineers basically to select which team they want to join. And you know, it sounds really scary for me initially, um, because it could end up being super chaos. And, and what if everyone want to be in that team? And you know, all possible things could happen. Um, so the way we do it, we ask the product managers to first explain the purpose for each of the team. This is why the team is so important. This is what value this team is going to bring to the customer. And by telling the why and the purpose, then each of the engineers can come and talk and ask, what impact can I make in this team? So surprisingly, it actually went really well. Um, the first iteration, we got overloaded in one team, for example. And then we say, look, we need to do second iteration and keep doing it. After, after a few iterations, we end up in really good spot. The biggest benefit we get from this is the level of engagement from each individual is amazing. Because they literally pick the work they want to work on, the people they want to work with, and even the manager they want to work for. And that is the most engaging thing for them. Process. One concept in Lean is about make the work feasible. 
for each of the team to be able to work as an IC unit, there must not be a silo of information. Information must be readily available to everyone within the team. We apply Agile and specifically Kanban into the team, and we use this wall. Everybody have a wall. They can see exactly what's going on and which, which stage each of the story is in. So each story, the yellow cards, is, is, is has a value in it what value it's going to bring to the customer. And if you can see the process flow, it's no longer about function. It's no longer about dev, QA, or deploy. But it's all about basically how, uh, how we, the stages of the, of the story. And each team is, is responsible, everyone in the team responsible to bring the value to completion as quickly as possible. So it's no longer about segregation of duties. I'm just going to do my, my bit but everybody is trying hard to pull the cart to the right-hand side to deliver to the customer. And for autonomy and self-organizing teams to work, alignment is needed. If alignment is not there, we end up with chaos because everybody just do their own thing. So to create alignment, we employ OKRs, objective and key results. We borrow this from Google. So the way we do it is, Objective comes from the manager, from the top. These are the problems that we need to feel, fix. This is the problems that we need to, to, to address. And we get the, the team to come up with the key results. So team, why don't you think what sort of things we can do to achieve that objective? And come back and then we have discussion. So this could be multiple iterations. But for the team to be able to come up with the key results, it gives them the empowerment to be able to own the whole thing themselves. We also employ um, a dual track agile. So in a lot of companies, when they introduce agile, moving from waterfall, most of them then end up doing mini waterfall within the things. They get uh, someone else to do the requirements and then pass it over to the team to, to build. We want the team to do the requirements themselves. Um, and we want to be able to do it in a lockstep process. So while we're doing this delivery, we're also doing discovery. And then we're doing delivery and we're doing discovery. So everything is a flow. So everything is a constant experiment. Um, it's no longer a stop-start kind of process. And, and this, this is a very hard process to follow. And it took us a long time to implement this. Um, but once it is working, we can see a constant flow of features going out to the customer. Last thing is architecture. Um, and architecture is something that typically people overlook when they're doing transformation. And there's a famous law in computer science called Conway's law. It's basically saying your architecture will mimic your organization structure. So because we started with as one engineering team of 20 people, we kind of end up with a really big convoluted architecture. And when we want to scale to multiple teams, we have bottleneck. And it was really difficult to make changes to the code. So we need to employ a new architecture. So basically, we move from monolith on the left, where everything is together, to the right-hand side, which is a microservices architecture, which means each of the team is responsible to build the system they are responsible for. So they own the full end-to-end. They can build faster, they can deliver fairly faster, and they have the full ownership. So, just to recap everything, for us to scale is we need to be able to adapt to change very quickly. And to be able to adapt to change very quickly, decision must be made on the floor by people who are closest to the work. And for, the, for, for that to work, we need to build self-organizing teams. And this is a summary of self-organizing team. It's a cross-functional team with T-shaped members who have a great attitude and a desire to learn, are motivated by a strong purpose that is aligned to the company's goals, with full autonomy to reach those, and are coached and supported by seven leaders. Thank you. <laughs>